Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and we have Alistair McLeod with us again today. Um, it's really good to have him, and uh, just for those of you who may not be familiar with Alistair, although I think most of you probably are because he is such a frequent guest, um, goldmoney.com research, the research page at goldmoney.com. Alistair, every Thursday of every week, puts out a very important, I think a very must-read essay about current market conditions um, pertaining most often to gold. Uh, and uh, he is, it's an, in, well, probably the most important piece that I read for my work every week. So I, I really think people should pay attention to it. So it's uh, goldmoney.com. And the research page here. Thanks for joining me again, Alistair. That's my pleasure, Jay. You know, I want to uh, have you talk a little bit to our listeners about two articles you've recently written. One, February eighteenth, titled "The Future of Money and Gold." Uh, the future of money is gold. And then February twenty-fifth, that's uh, money monetary inflation. The next step. Uh, it would seem as though we're probably on to some monetary inflation now. We're seeing commodity prices rise fairly dramatically, copper and a lot of the base metals. Uh, the food, um, a lot of food uh, items have gone up, uh, the grains and so forth, as Michael Oliver reminds us. Uh, the uh, commodities have been dormant for so long, and he sees uh, gold and silver, gold is especially as the leader of the commodity bull market, uh, and that they've been on a breather for seven or eight months or so, uh, and commodities are starting to catch up. And that, I think, is giving people some concern about inflation, the bond market starting to spike up a bit. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you first of all, have you fo- maybe focus first on the monetary inflation article of February 25th. Um, I believe that you and I both see inflation as a rise in the money supply. Is that right? Uh, Yes, that's correct, Jay. I mean, um, in classical economics, it was always understood that inflation was um, inflation in the quantity of money. Right. And the consequence of that was rising prices. So that's the way around it is. But, of course, modern economists put it the other way around. They just say inflation is uh, the rise in the general level of prices. Yeah. So. When money is created, money is, is pumped into the system. It can go either into financial assets. It can go anywhere, but it can go into financial assets, bidding up the stocks and bonds. And, of course, that's what we've been seeing in spades. And uh, that doesn't get counted then as inflation. But it certainly is a redistribution of income that's taking place, isn't it, when that yes. takes place? Yeah, yes, that's right. I, um, the way to look at it um, is uh, think in terms of parts of the economy. Uh, if you have financial assets and financial assets are generally rising in value, then actually what's happening is that with respect to financial assets as a whole, the purchasing power of the currency is falling. Um, if there was a sort of random, you know, some some financial assets increasing in price and others falling in price, mm-hmm. um, there was a general mix, then mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able necessarily to turn around and say the cause of it is actually the purchasing power of the money changing but when everything is going in the same direction you can certainly say that um you're not a big believer in velocity of money as playing a part and i guess that's because the monetary the monetary aggregates are there so i mean some people like uh, daniel d martino booth the other day was talking about a lack of velocity and some people are saying well we're not going to have to worry about rising commodity prices because there's no velocity people aren't spending they're just keeping their money under a mattress so to speak but you're not a big believer in that concept, are you? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, it, it's the velocity thing. Uh, the, the reason it, rise, it, it, it arises is that if, if you look at the original um, uh, equation of exchange, in, in other words, the relationship between money and prices, um, it was clear to uh, those that put together the Um, the concept and then subsequently the equation that a change in the quantity of money was not translated automatically into um, a change in uh, the general level of prices. But in this case, I mean, they would use GDP, if you like, as the other side of the equation. So what they do is they introduce a factor. They introduce a new element, which they have called velocity. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get any equation you like to balance. Let's say the equation <laughs> is, is shoes are equal to bottles of gin. Uh-huh. Now, patently, they're not. 
But if you put in a variable, so you say shoes times a variable are the equivalent of or equal to gin, then your equation balances. And it'll always balance. Why? Because the variable will always change to, to take up the slack. And that actually is, is all that velocity um, uh, element is in, 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 in the monetary equation. Um, it is actually no more than that. It doesn't. So changes in velocity don't actually tell you anything. Um, I mean, it, the better way to look at it is to think conceptually that if you have an economy uh, which is run on sound money and free markets, then uh, money will be scarce, but people will use it efficiently. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if, on the other hand, um, uh, you 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 have fiat currency and you have a, a central bank who who weaponizes that uh, fiat currency in the name of trying to manage the economy, then uh, the relationship uh, uh, with the quantity of money uh, is no longer that money is scarce. You find that more and more money tends to get pumped into the economy by the central bank. Mm -hmm. And those are the, basically the two conditions that exist. And we can see today that with uh, M1 in America, which um, incidentally they have changed to include uh, savings, yeah. Uh, you know, is 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 now. It. I think I worked it out this morning. It is ninety two and a half percent of GDP. Wow. I mean, this is you know. So M one is ninety two and a half percent of GDP. Well, admittedly, actually, I I must say that um, the other thing you need to do is to put in the government's. Uh, uh, a general account at the Fed because that's a bank account just like it, like yours mm -hmm. at your bank, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. that should be included. But uh, the Fed doesn't include it, which I think is a big mistake in the way they construct the 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 uh, monetary, um, uh, you know, the money supply figures. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, this again is another reason for not looking at something like velocity of circulation because mm -hmm. first we need to define what M one is mm -hmm. or. M2 is. And there are all sorts of things you can either include or not include. Mm -hmm. And the Fed takes the decision as to what it will include. Now, that is not based on what you and I want, what how you and I use money. It's the way the Fed looks at money. So yeah. the whole idea, the whole concept of applying uh, mathematical economics to things like money supply, velocity, and all the rest of it is actually fatally flawed right from the start. We've talked about in the past um, that the the government defines inflation. Any it, it, it keeps changing the rules, of course. And you know, John Williams has talked about it. You and I have talked about it. Uh, your concept, your belief is as 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 is my belief. John Williams and others that have looked at it that the actual cost of living. So forget about inflation in terms of the, just the money supply uh, and the you know financial asset inflation, all that. But just in terms of what it might cost a family of four to stay alive, you know, to pay the rents and buy the food and transportation, all of its basic living costs. Uh, the Fed is, you know, tries to, or the, or the government tries to suggest that it's around 2%, nothing serious, nothing really to worry about here. Your thoughts uh, are that it's much higher than that, I believe. That is the, yeah. sort of the, the cost of staying alive. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think the experience of anyone living in America and anyone living in almost any other country, um, even countries with alleged uh, deflation, in other words, falling prices, will mm -hmm. say that that's not the reality. I mean, you know, it's very difficult to know how much the cost of living actually is rising. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that the, the concept of the cost of living is really the general price level. How is that changing? Now, the general price level is a theoretical um, concept, mm -hmm. but it's not something you can measure because uh, your uh, general price level differs from my general price level. And, um, you know, uh, our parents who are probably pensioners, if they're still alive, mm -hmm. their price, you know, the, their general price level experience differs as well. So, you know, it, it's it's um, it's 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 really just a concept and uh, trying to um, sort of steer an economy by um, looking at. Uh, the monetary effect as it hits prices uh, produced by a department which is um, uh, for very good reasons determined to keep those uh, evidence of the price increases down because of the cost to government 
of indexation, um, you know, it's like um, driving along, uh, looking in the rear view mirror. It, it, you know, <laughs> it is absolutely crazy. And I think I think it's it, it, it is a far better thing to really understand um, what money is, um, uh, the the economic effects of uh, unsound money, uh, and um, uh, you know, for example, one thing that uh, nobody ever says in government is that um, you know printing money transfers wealth from the ordinary people and. By ordinary people, I mean the producers in an economy, the people mm-hmm. who, who, who you want to produce more to, um, you know, make the economy better. What you're doing with by printing money is transferring wealth from them because mm-hmm. you're lowering their salaries, you're lowering their savings, uh, and uh, you're giving it to the government. I, you know, is is this the, is this the way to progress as an economy? The answer is no. But no. governments do, you know, they ignore that. Um, they ignore that because they are determined to uh, pursue uh, a modern macroeconomic, a neo-Keynesian uh, approach to managing the economy. They believe they've got a role in making the economy better. And not only that, but also because they run budget deficits and those have become continual rather than over, over you know, sort of balancing over the cycle, um, they need that financed. And the only way it can finance with reluctant taxpayers is basically the magic money tree, um, you know, what the central bank does. And uh, you put all those things together and you can see that actually this idea that uh, by expanding the quantity of money, which has been really dramatic over the last, uh, well, certainly since last March, mm-hmm. uh, you can see that actually it is just impoverishing us in a way which is not recorded. Yeah, and how is it going to be financed? That's the that's the question. Um, we're seeing interest rates rise now. Do you think those are are rising because of the the bond markets are sniffing out inflation? They're sniffing. They're starting to realize that. Uh, that the dollar's purchasing power is, is declining rather dramatically? Uh, or do you think, you know, the happy talk, of course, would have us believe that the bond rates are rising because the economy is booming and everything is just honky-dory? Uh, I don't believe you think that, but why do you think the rates are starting to rise so dramatically? And what is that going to, uh, when I say dramatically, they're still very low, but they're, they've gone up relatively fast, the 10-year Treasury, for example. Uh, yeah. wh- why do you think they're rising and, and what kind of uh, problems is that going to pose for the Fed and for our government? Well, they're rising for one very simple reason, and that is you've got an awful lot of foreigners who own um, U.S. Treasury debt, mm-hmm. portfolio investments, uh, cash in the in the banks. I think the cash in the banks and uh, short term um, uh, 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 bills are around, but they're over six trillion dollars. I mean, uh-huh. it's foreign owned. So, put yourself in the shoes of a foreigner, and you see um, that not only are you getting paid nothing in your bank, but also, as I ar- argued in that article which you referred to earlier, it looks like um, uh, we could get a situation where um, your deposits might be refused by the bank because mm-hmm. they haven't the balance sheet capacity um, and, uh, you know, they will they will refuse it basically by um, saying, well, if you deposit your money with us, then uh, we're going to have to charge you for it. In other words, a negative interest rate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, under those circumstances, you can see that it um, changes, if you like, the relationship between the value of the dollar today and the value of the dollar tomorrow. Now, the value of the dollar tomorrow, particularly with all this money printing, you know, just from, bear in mind that you're looking at it through a foreigner's eyes, um, basically means that you are going to have to have a higher rate of interest compensation for holding on to dollars, which are going to be worth less tomorrow than mm-hmm. they are today. Yeah. And as the situation progresses, you know, so you can see this is why interest rates uh, have to rise. I mean, they reflect um, uh, the loss of purchasing power of the dollar as anticipated between now and, say, a year's time or two years' time or ten years' time. Now, on that basis, uh, you could easily argue that not only is the dollar overvalued, but um, you would need to see the ten-year uh, U.S. Treasury yield rise quite significantly, even from here, before we um, uh, make a, a case for hanging on to your foreign currency, uh, your uh, investments in dollars. Um, given also that at the same time, uh, bond yields in, in in Europe and Japan are also now rising. I mean, 
you know, it's the, okay, they're negative um, out to, you know, sort of X date. But, I mean, we're no longer looking at a situation where um, uh, the the German bond yields are, uh, are now, you know, 10 years are negative. No, you know, the yields are moving up. And, of course, that, again, reduces um, the uh, relative attraction of um, holding dollars as opposed to euros. So... It's, it's factors like that that start the general um, collapse, if you like, in bond prices uh, and uh, takes uh, the pricing of the bond markets away from the control of the Fed. I mean, it wasn't so long ago we were talking about o Operation Twist, but I think it's going to be almost impossible for the Fed to do that and maintain, um, uh, you know, sort of a low gradient of interest rates from uh, short term through to long term right. without destroying the dollar. Right. So Operation Twist would be to uh, would be to sell the short end of the curve and buy the long end, I guess, is what the Fed would do to try to force long term rates down. Right. And yeah. I think I think what they would do rather than sell the short end <laughs> is, is they would just they'd buy they'd buy the short end. They would just buy, the, you know, buy mediums and longs and just yeah. <laughs> try and suppress the yields. Yes, I see. OK. And uh, and and so what it means, though, they're going to have to create money to buy those. So. So it's it's just it seems to me that as to, in order to suppress the interest rates, which will it's it will start to see the the U.S. government not even look, you know, it would be obviously uh, insolvent at some point in time. I mean, how much, you know, and what is it going to do to the equity markets? I mean, we see just a, a teeny little bit of a rise in rates, and it sends the the equity markets for a tail into a tailspin. And it it just seems to me that we're going to have. To, I mean, the only recipe that I can see, Alistair, is that the Fed has to create more and more money faster and faster and keep shoveling it into the system to try to keep it from, you know, to try to keep the, the thing from imploding into some sort of a, a financial market collapse. Yes. I mean, this is this is why I, I keep on citing the, you know, the John Law experience of exactly uh -huh. 300 years ago. What the Fed are doing with QE is basically they're trying to perpetuate a wealth effect because QE goes um, from the Fed uh, through the commercial banks to pension funds and insurance companies. And the pension funds and the insurance companies end up with cash having sold uh, some of their bonds to the Fed through through the system. And it has to be done like that because the only accounts uh, at the Fed are held by commercial banks. The Fed does mm -hmm. not have direct access to pension funds and insurance companies. So the result is that uh, pension funds and insurance companies, um, you know, sort of, if you like, they buy a bit more risk, like, uh, you know, they go for corporate bonds, maybe adjust their portfolios to have a bit more equities. So that spreads the wealth effect, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, it also makes it cheaper for the zombies to finance themselves in the junk bond market. You know? mm -hmm. So there are all these sort of reasons why uh, the Fed should do QE from the Fed's point of view. Um, but, you know, on the one hand, it's all very well talking about pushing money into financial asset markets. But um, if at the same time uh, you are driving interest rates down, then... Mm -hmm. You know, effectively, you're working against. Uh, so, sorry, I'm sorry. If, if in, if at the same time you fail to control the the, the interest rates, particularly mm -hmm. at the end, then you risk losing control of that uh, wealth effect of puffing up asset prices. And this is exactly what John Law did in 1720, 1719, 1720. And when the project failed, it failed because he had to print so much money. Uh, that he, he he effectively crashed the currency and the bubble popped at the same time. All uh, right. Rising interest rates is the first sign of that John Law experience being repeated, not just in France, but for the whole world. I mean, this is yeah. very, very serious. So we're seeing that happen now, in your view. That's what we're starting to see. Now, with just a couple of minutes left, I, my apologies for not giving you more time to talk about this, but the future of money is gold. In that article, you talk about how the politicians are going to be almost forced at some point to uh, to go to honest money. Uh, with the time we have left, a couple of minutes or so, can you make that case? And I'll keep my mouth shut. 
Yes, the other side of the John Law bubble is that not only did uh, the Mississippi venture um, collapse, but also the currency collapsed, and the currency actually collapsed uh, entirely on the foreign exchanges. And I think that um, uh, the, the, that experience will be repeated here, which basically means that um, so long as governments insist on having fiat, they will have no money. They will have mm -hmm. money that has got no purchasing power whatsoever. So the only way they can stabilize it and being cynical, let's say the politicians draw their salaries, <laughs> uh, is to uh, anchor it to gold. A lot of people seem to think that Bitcoin might be the future, um, but central banks don't own Bitcoin. I mean, the way the scheme would have to work is that you have fiat currency distributed. You have to make that convertible into gold at the holder of the fiat money's option at a price which you can sustain. And not only exchangeable into gold but you must issue gold coinage and that's the whole point so that uh you know in america you'd have golden eagles and the uk we've mm -hmm. still we've got sovereigns we've still got mm -hmm. sovereigns uh, mm -hmm. and that's legal tender um so you can see that th the means is there to do it to stabilize the whole situation this is going to be so total that they will have no option but to pursue that route all right, and uh, I would just say to folks that want to get a little more detail, because we don't have the time for Alistair to explain it all here, go read his last article uh, on that topic at uh, goldmoney.com. Uh, and, uh, and he fills in the, the blanks very well there. Uh, so I, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much, Alistair, once again, for being with us and explaining these complicated topics to our to our listeners. It's, uh, it's greatly appreciated and, and uh, very very helpful, I'm sure. 